Lives of the Unconscious. A podcast on psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Episode 14. The Oedipus Complex. Timeless or obsolete? At the latest, when this term comes into play, all analytical alarm bells start going off. Oedipus Complex. This concept appears to epitomize everything disreputable and all those seemingly abysmally fanciful psychoanalytic concepts which conflate childhood and sexuality and give birth to concepts such as castration anxiety, penis envy, incestuous desire, and so on. Sure enough, the first tenet from the therapeutic box of cliches is, pronounced in dark whispers, it's about the mother. The Freudian theory based on the Oedipus myth has made psychoanalysis famous, while admittedly also allowing a dense thicket of fantasies, prejudices, and misunderstandings to multiply, undoubtedly also on account of the sometimes pretentious terminology, all of which has made talking about this topic with any candor quite difficult. But what, after all, could possibly be straightforward about such a topic? What exactly is the Oedipus complex about? And is the concept still relevant for psychoanalysis today? To come straight to the point, there is no single uniform answer to this question, just as there is no single uniform psychoanalysis. The topic has been highly controversial from the very beginning, even within psychoanalysis itself, and remains so to this day. The explosive nature inherent in all these discussions may perhaps have something to do with the subject matter of the Oedipus complex, the complicated relationship of love between the generations, or to be more precise, between children and their parents and the resulting inclinations and aversions. At least here, one may be justified in assuming a certain agreement that parent-child relationships involve a complex and thus contradictory web of attachments and feelings, affection, love, longing, but also anger, envy, rivalry, and last but not least, guilt and fear. This is noticeable in that the relationship between parents and children is by no means a good subject for discussion, and thus extremely prone to conflict. It is a topic just as ill-advised for discussions during Christmas dinner as the topics of money or inheritance, especially if at any point the parents feel attacked. Or, think of the embarrassment that parents cause their children by showing them loving affection in public. Everyone may also recognize those blind spots that parents have with respect to their own children, those special preferences and overindulgences, or some particular harshness, something that may be distributed unequally among the siblings, where the respective gender certainly plays a role. Say, for example, the grown man, who still lives with his mother, has never been in a relationship, is barely able to advance in life, and who is nevertheless adored by his mother for every utterance, and to be sure, is mothered constantly. Or a mother and her grown daughter who have a very conflict-ridden relationship, quarreling and hurling all kinds of things at each other, and yet cannot let go of one another. There is, on the other hand, that multi-fibered web into which the child's emotional life towards their parents has been woven. One could say, from the cradle to the grave and beyond, affection and love, longing, gratitude, but also anger, the need for distance, shame, guilt, or even an agonizing feeling of pity. A complicated and contradictory meshwork, which, with these few brushstrokes, may sketch out what the term complex means. One of the developmental tasks of probably every human is to position themselves somewhere within this field of parental relationships, which may turn out more or less successfully and remains a task throughout life. 
This, perhaps, is a crucial consideration. The Oedipus complex is not a disorder, but rather the expression of an important psychological development. In order to understand the meaning of the developmental task summed up in the catchphrase Oedipus complex, it is necessary to project oneself into the situation of a small child. In the first years of life, relationships are characterized by an exceptional closeness and heartfelt intimacy, in most cases beginning with the relationship to the mother. The child is dependent on this relationship in every aspect of its life. All at once it directs its desire and lust, but also its anger and frustration at this relationship. From sucking on the breast, to physical closeness, cuddling, caressing, and other forms of love between parent and child that are so important for the child's development, but also crying, biting, throwing fits, and other expressions of anger or even aggression. The child's world is, here the first technical term from psychoanalytic terminology, essentially dyadic. That is, a world of I and you, in which mother and child are virtually one and the same, apart from occasional frustration and brief separations. The mother can be temporarily replaced by another attachment figure without changing the dyadic character of this relationship. The child experiences the mother as if she were to exist for no one else, as if she were a part of the child, reacting to its stirrings and wishes and resonating with the child's sensations. This indeed constitutes what we call maternal sensitivity. As we have heard in episode 6 on mentalization, for the child, it is difficult at first to imagine that the mother is an independent, separate being, with an inner domain of her own. That also means a sphere from which the child is excluded. In the classical psychoanalytic conception, and thus with it the traditional bourgeois gender roles of Western societies, it is then the father who, as the third party, enters into this relationship between mother and child. The father is the person with whom the mother has her own relationship, which does not exclusively pertain to the child. The mother and the father share a domain that is not accessible to the child. In the classical conception, it is the sexual intimacy between mother and father that is paradigmatic, which, although concealed from the child, does not go unnoticed. This experience, two's company, three's a crowd, of a third member who separates, yet also guarantees security outside of the relationship to the mother, can also take place without the real father, as in, for example, kindergarten. And it need not necessarily be a man. What is important is this experience of the mother as not relating exclusively to the child that beyond the relationship to the mother, there is not complete nothingness, but someone else. The mother has her own interests, longings, and love, which do not pertain to the child, but to some other, some third thing, for example, the father. Initially, this is all extremely frightening for the child, while at the same time, therein lies a critical step in development, which is referred to as triangulation. Out of thinking in two dimensions, in which there is only me and mama, becomes thinking in three dimensions. According to the motto, that which takes place can also be grasped from another third position. There is my relationship to my mother, but also my mother's relationship to someone else. My mother is perhaps different than how I see her. One also speaks of the ability to change perspectives, i.e., in addition to the first-person perspective, it is also possible to take on the perspective of another third person, from which to observe others, but also oneself. Only then does thinking about oneself and others become operative. Children who have difficulties at this developmental threshold remain at least in part captive to this two-dimensional thinking. Here one speaks of early disorders, sometimes also called pre-edible, 
as the typical Oedipal conflict situation has not even been reached yet. These people find it difficult to reflect on themselves and to mentally distance themselves from their own experiences. Or, reflection is merely logical, mathematical, not saturated with real emotional experience, usually fizzling out ineffectively, which poses a significant challenge for therapies that consist in working out interpretations. Typical pre oedipal disorders are, for example, borderline or narcissistic disorders, but also schizoid personality developments, in which the whole world is conferred with a particular meaning that is difficult to comprehend, while the realm of mutual, shared meanings remains sealed off. Oftentimes, a schizoid development correlates with a too-close, all-but-devouring bond to the mother, in which there is little room for any third party. Here, the father is the savior, who releases the child from the deep entanglement with the mother, or is rather unable to do so. Whereas, if the child does enter into this relational space of three dimensions, then it has arrived into a world where other people have their own independent internal worlds. The world is not exclusively there for oneself. One has to carve out one's place within it. And for small children, the most important place is, for the moment, by their mother's side. It should be noted that the mother's desire for another makes the child jealous. The child fights for the mother's favor and wants to outdo all rivals, which, paradigmatically, is the father. While at the same time, it is afraid of its inferiority in this conflict. The father is so much stronger and more powerful. He has, both figuratively and literally, a much greater potency. The fear of the father in the classical Freudian conception refers to the so-called castration anxiety. That means the fear that if one faces off with the father, he will steal the central means of one's potency, here from the perspective of the male, the penis. Of course, this is not to be understood in the literal sense. Even if children do have very concrete fantasies along just these lines. Initially, it is about the still very precarious status of one's own identity, here notably the male identity, meaning to be able to exist as a man, the fear of being belittled, of being inferior and impotent, and those who have especially great insecurities may later have to resort to special aids, from a big car to a macho demeanor, according to the motto, check it out, I've got the biggest thing around. In this conception, the female perspective would be inverted, i.e., competing with the mother for the father, but we will come back to that later. Part of normal development is, in the final analysis, a feat of renunciation. The child must accept that it cannot have the mother exclusively to itself. This renunciation is painful, but it paves the child's way into the world beyond the relationship to the mother and eventually also beyond the family. Friendships in kindergarten and school, in relationships of love in later periods of life, their own crew, etc. However, this also involves a renunciation on the part of the parents, which we will return to later. This concerns the maintenance of generational barriers, for the Oedipus complex ultimately describes a generational conflict. The child belongs to their generation, the parents to theirs. While forms of incest break through this generational barrier, be that concretely in extreme cases of actual sex acts upon the child, or be that more symbolically, in which the child replaces the partner on an emotional level and, in place of the partner, becomes their central point of contact, the exclusive object of their love, for instance, by still sleeping in the mother's bed, far beyond the necessary age, or the like. Like all Greek myths dealing with a central theme of humanity, the Oedipus myth describes an episode in which the generational barrier becomes fragile, 
Oedipus is born as the son of King Laius and his wife Jocasta. Before his birth, the father Laius receives an oracle, saying that his son will one day slay his father and marry his mother. Laius thus deserts the infant so as to kill him and escape his fate. Oedipus is rescued and grows up far away with foster parents, without knowing anything about his origins. One day, he too learns of the oracle about him. He leaves home in the belief that he is protecting his supposed parents and travels directly into the land of his actual parents. In a dispute, he slays his father Laius without recognizing him. After solving the riddle of the Sphinx, he receives the hand of the widowed queen as a reward, his mother, Jocasta. Yet he is not happy as a ruler. Curse and disease plague his land until Oedipus sets out to find the cause and comes to learn of the truth about himself. As a punishment, he blinds himself and banishes himself into exile. There is a very long history of how this myth has been received, and it neither begins nor ends with Freud. Even biological interpretations have played a role here, as in the tradition of neuropsychoanalysis, which we will not take up any further here. We have added important works to the bibliography. One line of interpretation points to Oedipus as a figure who actually follows through on his infantile wishes, resulting in catastrophe. The generational boundaries are violated, the love between mother and son, the rivalry with the father, all brought to fruition through actual deeds, not renounced, but rather acted upon. In this sense, the myth is a dark, cautionary tale. Nothing is more uncanny than when desires become reality. And even ignorance is no protection here. More modern views see in the Oedipus complex the interwoven fabric of relationship dynamics between the parents and child, thus occupying not only the child's perspective, but also that of the parents, whereby today it is no longer possible in many societies to assign clear roles to father and mother. Given these circumstances, there are then at least two alternatives for what can interfere with a child's progression out of parental ties or the preservation of generational barriers. 1. A too close bond or the difficulty of separating. The child's gradual unfastening of primary attachments requires that both the child and the parents are capable of relinquishment which applies to the father as much as to the mother. The child increasingly says no to parental love, thereby also doing harm to the parental need for love. The parents have to withstand being rejected, that the child increasingly goes their own way, and they must also endure the fear and insecurity that come with this. The more insecure the parents are here, meaning the more dependent the parents are on the child's love, the more difficult this process becomes. Say, for example, a mother who is extremely hurt when the child leaves her, or when the child feels very comfortable with others, sometimes even more comfortable, for example, at kindergarten, with friends, or even with their father. So hurt, in fact, that she is not only sad, but simply cannot bear this kind of rejection, and either intervenes jealously aggressively mothering the child, imposing her love, as it were, allowing no chance to discover other objects of love, or withdraws bruised and hurt. Such relationship patterns exist in many variations. One particular to present day goes under the catchword helicopter parents. Parental bonds in the form of excessive love, sometimes narcissistic fantasies, in which everything is ostensibly done only for the child, which then becomes fatal, especially when parents do not reflect on their own neediness. Hyperactive, aggressive children are perhaps also children who are trying with helpless rage to free themselves from such entanglements. All progress, every step away from the parents, 
is for these children fraught with conflict and strong feelings of guilt about hurting the parents, insulting their need for love. Sometimes this is related to a tendency towards failure later in life, an inability to overcome certain thresholds in life without the parents. For example, not passing exams despite having the competence, or not being able to study for exams due to some curious inhibition, or not being able to enter into stable love relationships. Number two, the parents' envy of their children. One may think of the father Laios, who, out of fear of one day being overthrown and killed by his son, tries to kill him himself. Here, in turn, lies a central moment of the generational conflict encompassed in the Oedipus myth. This concerns the ability, or rather, inability, of the parents to allow themselves to be superseded by their children, to one day make room for them, to stand down in the generational line of succession, and with this, to also accept one's own aging and dying. One also speaks of the so-called Laios complex, which, time and again, has become a theme in artistic creations. One need only think of Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, for example. Stepping down in the successive line of generations is especially difficult when many of life's wishes remain unfulfilled, when squandered opportunities in life have not been mourned, when parents burden their children with their own childlike needs, help me to become that which I want to be, and I can't stand it that you are now young, loved, still hold promise of success, while I am supposed to fade into the background. One thinks, for example, of the fairy tale Snow White about an envious mother. However, the tyrannical father who truculently punishes and persecutes his children if they become dangerous to him is often enough still a reality, especially in traditional family structures. Here, the rivalry between parents and children is dealt with openly and with violence. And here, the child's prevailing feeling is the fear of their parents. And so this other variant can, at least within certain milieus and forms of socialization, once again center around feelings of guilt. The child's feeling of having to make their parents happy, having to give them room for their unfulfilled wishes, while making oneself smaller than one is, making light of their own success in front of their parents or even hiding it. Naturally, there is also a good-natured twist to this generational conflict, that the parents can take a positive view of their child's success and progression, or of their parting from home, can see a piece of themselves fulfilled in their child, perhaps even consummating something that was denied to them, or that the parents can take pleasure in their child's journey, even if it does not correspond with their own wishes. Again, this presupposes an ability to grieve and a confrontation with one's own finitude. The child, on the other hand, needs a certain degree of separation aggression, must confront fear and guilt, setting off on one's own, no longer lingering in the comfortable bonds where they are the center of the world. Parting from the parents also means for the child heartache and an encounter with finitude remaining in the parental bonds also an illusion of timelessness. The difficulty of truly leaving behind or transforming parental ties is ultimately a stumbling block for all new beginnings or changes of any kind. To be sure, not least one of the central questions that are decisive for social change and new beginnings, as family ties go deeper than every political trend. Finally, the question to what extent such relationship dynamics differ between the sexes. Freud's examination of female sexuality, say in so-called penis envy, is perhaps some of the weakest parts of his work and doesn't measure up to the status of today's very multifaceted discussions. We would like to base our reflections on Thomas Ogden's conception, one of the most influential contemporary psychoanalysts. For the sake of a simpler presentation, we will have to leave aside some issues, 
say the question as to what extent the gender duality, male-female, is itself the result of social processes. However, for this, we would like to refer here to the controversial work of the psychoanalyst Jessica Benjamin. Ogden's central consideration is that the different roles that the child encounters in their interaction with the parents cannot be linked solely to the father or mother. Instead, they are psychological functions that must also be regulated within a person. A mother must also fulfill fatherly functions, a father also motherly. Just as every man also has feminine aspects, every woman also masculine. Whereby here, motherly and fatherly mean the attributions of specific roles and gender identities, not mere biology. For instance, a father who can push a baby carriage without a sense of shame, who loves his child dearly, uses tender words with him, and can touch him lovingly, without the fear of losing his masculinity in the process. And a mother who can also wrestle, climb around on the monkey bars, or play trains and Legos with her child, even with her daughter, without dismissing it as a man thing. The point is not that mother and father are exactly the same. What is important, however, is a certain amount of room for play, if the child has the experience of encountering motherly love from the father, while also fatherly love from the mother, it is easier to break away from the close relationship with one parent and enter into a space with relationships in three dimensions. In Ogden's conception, different relationship dynamics come about depending upon the gender of the child and depending crucially on which normative notions of gender the child is exposed to. Differences, for example, in heterosexual or homosexual orientation are no longer treated by contemporary psychoanalysis as a question of normalcy versus disorder, but rather as a different variance in sexual preference, in which biographical, social, and biological factors play a role. By the way, even in classical psychoanalysis, no clear line was drawn between sexual preferences. Freud had assumed that people have always had varied sexual predispositions, and that a preference solidifies out of a variety of influences only of the course of one's life, or at a minimum, that quite fluid, variable sexual preferences always remain latently present. But the question of sexual preferences is a topic we will deal with another time. For the sake of simplicity, we will further investigate the example of heterosexual development. For a son, a heterosexual orientation means that his sexual preference remains with the gender of his earliest attachment figure, the mother. For the daughter, on the other hand, this means a shift of orientation, namely towards the sphere of the male. The central problem of the heterosexual male's gender identity is, as it were, differentiating between mother and lover, the preservation of his male identity in opposition to the world of the female to which he feels himself drawn. He must detach himself from the relationship to his mother, delineating himself from the inner mother, but also open up and give himself over to his lover. The conflict consists in loving affectionately without becoming a mama's boy which is easier for him if he has experienced not only motherly, but also fatherly affection in his relationship to his mother. The conflict-ridden side becomes apparent when, for example, sexual desire progressively declines over the course of longer relationships. The more the lover is a trusted attachment figure, the more precarious sexual desire becomes. For over the attachment figure lies the template of the mother, especially if at some point the lover becomes a mother herself, namely of one's own children. The very same phenomena also occurs with women, albeit with inverted points of reference, which can involve an unpleasant dynamic in the couple's intimacy. Often the consequence of an uncertain differentiation from the mother, together with an over-identification with the masculine, and the corresponding rejection of the female, is 
the macho man or the tough guy, who vehemently rejects everything associating him with any feminine traits. This often manifests itself in extreme prejudice and disgust against homosexuality, which in this kind of macho thinking is equated with a loss of masculinity. Behind this is usually a deep fear of the feminine, an insecure gender identity that has been able to escape the maternal bond only with great effort and must, time and again, assure itself of its masculinity anew. It is perhaps not only a cliché to say that behind every tough guy there is a tight maternal bond. And in most cases, this hard shell protects a very soft and boyishly vulnerable core. Just think of the widely known man flu, a sudden breakdown of male strength and inviolability when faced with a supposedly harmless cold, when the man suddenly becomes very high-maintenance, fearful, sniveling, and childlike. In Ogden's conception, women tend to have a somewhat more secure gender identity. For them, the attachment figure and object of love do not coincide, at least in the case of heterosexual orientation. Thus, women also frequently have less fear and revulsion towards homosexual inclinations. For female heterosexual development, however, the pathway to the father is often the precarious threshold. May she turn away from the mother, love the father, and draw close to the sphere of the masculine? Or does the mother perceive this turning away as betrayal? Can the mother also observe the daughter with male eyes? Or must she fend off everything masculine inside her, in the sense of an exclusive gender fellowship with the daughter, us against the men? Conversely, does the father overburden the daughter with his need for love, viewing her only as a woman and my sweet girl, so that an exclusive father-daughter fellowship develops from which the mother is shut out? Or can the father also see masculine traits in the daughter and imbue her with perceived masculine qualities, say, by also playing soccer or football with her, competing or roughhousing with her? With women, rejecting the masculine side often expresses itself as a hyper-feminine demeanor i.e. over-identification with the feminine, in a pink, glittering world, with the voice of a little girl, clumsy in all practical affairs, seemingly inept at any intellectualism rooted in abstract thought. In other words, a complete rejection of the sphere that is perceived as masculine. Whereby here, we are then again speaking of very powerful gender clichés indeed. Both modes, so to speak, John Wayne and Marilyn Monroe, are based on a resistance to aspects of the opposite sex, and in their own way, have something impotent and sterile, as much as they also mimic sexual potency. Creativity and imagination, as can be observed in most great artists, is also based on an interplay of the different aspects we hold inside. The question and the title of this episode Oedipus complex, timeless or obsolete, cannot be answered definitively. Much of the original conception most certainly does not correspond to some timeless normality, but rather to contemporary bourgeois norms at Freud's time, and is thus subject to historical change. It is not only the theory that is obsolete, but also the social reality to which it refers. Although this is certainly not true in every aspect, nor for every social milieu. The central state of conflicts, however, the generational conflict, the relationship of love between parents and their children, with all its ambivalent implications, is a topic that, whatever shape it takes on throughout the ages, is not obsolete and will probably never be so. This podcast is written and produced by Cecile Lutz and Jakob Müller. Translated in red by Solomon Lawrence.